Look at this stretch of Alaskan coastline. Every second, around 900,000 gallons of fresh water pour from these glacial rivers directly into the Pacific Ocean, enough to fill an Olympic swimming pool in under a second. From the moment you started watching this video till now, approximately 20 Olympic swimming pools have been leaked to the ocean. Now, imagine capturing that fresh drinking water and sending it 2,400 kilometers south through the world's longest pipeline. While Alaska drowns in surplus water, California is dying of thirst. The western United States faces its worst drought in 1,200 years, with Lake Mead hitting record lows and entire towns rationing water. But here's where it gets wild. Engineers have been refining plans since the 1960s for a pipeline that could pump 3.26 billion gallons daily from Alaska to California. The original proposal was called NAWAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance, and it might be humanity's most audacious water heist ever attempted. To understand why anyone would attempt this engineering moonshot, let's talk numbers. Alaska's coastal regions receive around 850 cubic kilometers of fresh water annually from rainfall, snow melt, and glacial melt. That's enough water to fill Lake Mead, America's largest reservoir, 65 times over every single year. Meanwhile, California's Central Valley, which produces 25% of America's food, operates on a groundwater deficit that hit nearly 7 million acre feet per year during recent droughts. According to a 2022 study published in Nature Communications, California's groundwater depletion has been accelerating since 2003, reaching crisis levels during the 2019 to 2021 drought period. Alaska dumps enough fresh water into the ocean every three days that could solve California's entire annual deficit. To put this in perspective, it's the equivalent of watching a billionaire light cash on fire to cook a marshmallow while their next door neighbor freezes to death because he can't pay for heating. Speaking of managing pressure and stress, this video is sponsored by BetterHelp. Researching this water crisis reminded me California is desperately seeking solutions for its drought, but how often do we address our own personal droughts? The mental exhaustion, the pressure, that feeling of running on empty? That's where therapy helps. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier. Fill out a questionnaire and match with a licensed therapist in as little as a couple of days. They're trained to listen and provide helpful, unbiased guidance. If it's not the right fit, easily switch therapists anytime at no extra cost. With over 7,000 reviews and a 4.3 rating on Trustpilot, it's a platform designed to make mental health support accessible. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash curious reason for 10% off your first month. Now, back to solving California's actual drought. The original 1964 NOAPA proposal wasn't just a pipeline, it was a continental redesign. The plan involved capturing water from Alaska's Yukon, Copper, and Taku rivers, plus Canada's Peace and Fraser rivers, before they reached the ocean. The water would be stored in an enormous 500 mile long reservoir carved from British Columbia's Rocky Mountain Trench, 16 times larger than Lake Mead, then distributed through 369 separate dams, canals, tunnels, and pumping stations. Think of it as a continental scale IV drip, keeping America's agricultural heart alive. Picture pipes 20 feet in diameter, dozens of pumping stations generating massive horsepower, crossing two international borders and three mountain ranges. It's essentially building the human circulatory system at a geographic scale. The engineering specs were mind-bending. Ralph M. Parsons Company estimated the system would deliver 120 million acre-feet of water annually. 78 million to the US, 22 million to Canada, and 20 million to Mexico. That's approximately 107 billion gallons flowing through the system every single day. But this idea faced immediate pushback. Politicians called it, quote, continental 
plumbing. Indigenous leaders called it environmental genocide. Canadian critics saw it as American resource theft. The project died in the 1970s, but its ghost haunts every California drought. Now here's where things get complex. Any pipeline would need to cross through Canada, specifically British Columbia, turning Canada into the middleman of North America's water future. And Canada is not thrilled about becoming America's water tower, especially after Trump's remark about Canada becoming a 51st state. Canadian law currently prohibits bulk water exports, treating water like a strategic resource rather than a commodity. Former Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien once said, water will be more valuable than oil in the 21st century, and he wasn't wrong. Water has become Canada's equivalent of Saudi Arabian oil, a national treasure they're fiercely protective of. But money complicates everything. Industry estimates suggest the pipeline could generate $10 billion annually in transit fees for Canada. That's enough to fund significant healthcare upgrades or infrastructure projects. Some Canadian politicians have quietly warmed to the idea, especially as climate change wreaks havoc on their own agricultural regions. Alaska's position is equally complex. It's a flaming red Republican, and California is deep blue Democrat, and they hate each other viscerally. While environmentalists oppose it strongly, the state would receive an estimated $2 billion yearly in water royalties. It's a crucial revenue as oil profits decline from their 1988 peak. Alaska's oil production has dropped over 75% since that peak, leaving a massive budget hole. It's like asking someone to sell their blood technically renewable, morally questionable, but financially tempting when you're broke. The international law here enters uncharted territory. Water rights between nations typically involve shared rivers, not wholesale extraction and transport across thousands of miles. Legal scholars compare it to the complexity of Arctic drilling rights, except water literally flows, making ownership claims fluid in every sense. Under NAFTA and its successor agreements, water remains contentiously undefined as either a tradable commodity or a sovereign resource, leaving the legal door uncomfortably ajar. Let's get into the brutal reality of making this work. Moving water uphill across a continent requires energy equivalent to powering two million homes continuously. Engineers originally proposed using hydroelectric power generated by the flowing water itself. But here's the problem. You can't create a perpetual motion machine. The energy required to pump water over mountain ranges would exceed what you could generate from its downhill flow. Here's the single biggest engineering challenge. The Coast Mountains. The pipeline would need to climb 1,200 meters in elevation while maintaining pressure across 2,400 kilometers. According to engineering studies, this requires a minimum of 17 massive pumping stations, each with complete backup systems. Why? Because if one station fails catastrophically, you've got a biblical flood situation on your hands. The redundancy systems alone would cost an estimated $20 billion. The pipeline would need to survive everything nature throws at it. Magnitude plus seven earthquakes along the Pacific Ring of Fire, temperatures reaching minus 60 degrees Celsius in Arctic winters, and crossing over 200 major wildlife corridors. Every joint, pump, and valve becomes a potential failure point. One breach in the wrong location could create an artificial river devastating entire communities. But here's what makes this fascinating. Similar mega projects already exist and work. Libya's great man-made river moves water 1,900 kilometers through the Sahara Desert, and engineers solved the extreme heat and sand infiltration problems. China's South to North Water Transfer Project, completed in stages through 2014, now redirects 44.8 billion cubic meters of water annually across the entire nation. The technology isn't theoretical, it's just never been attempted at this scale, crossing international boundaries with geopolitical dynamite. 
attached. The environmental impact assessment would be staggering. Removing even 5% of a river's flow triggers cascading ecosystem changes. Salmon populations could collapse, affecting bears, eagles, and orcas throughout the Pacific Northwest. River temperatures would rise, harming cold water species. Sediment flows would change, affecting coastal deltas. Scientists from the University of Alaska Fairbanks estimate that diverting water from the Yukon River could reduce salmon Salmon runs by 15 to 30 percent within a decade. Yet, climate scientists warn that doing nothing means California agriculture collapses by 2050, triggering nationwide food shortages and price spikes. It's choosing between environmental disruption in the north and economic catastrophe in the south. It's basically picking your poison from a menu where everything's toxic. Here's the brutal truth. The Pentagon's 2021 threat assessment lists water scarcity as a critical national security threat. Investment firms are buying water rights like they're betting on the apocalypse. But maybe the problem is not the scarcity, but the waste and inefficient use of agricultural land given the water scarcity. California agriculture uses 80% of the state's water to produce just 2% of its GDP. Almonds alone consume more water annually than all residential use combined. Switching to less thirsty crops could save more water than any pipeline would deliver, but confronting agricultural lobbies is politically impossible. So we'd rather build a trillion dollar pipe through two countries. That same money could build 30 massive desalination plants, modernize California's entire water infrastructure, and fund agricultural reform with change to spare. Singapore already recycles wastewater for 40% of its supply, but California won't touch it due to the yuck factor. The pipeline might never break ground, but its mere existence as a serious proposal signals something profound. We're entering an age where water, not oil, becomes the resource nations fight over. The pipeline is simultaneously humanity's greatest ambition and its most desperate admission of failure. We have the technology to move continental scale water supplies. We lack the political will to share resources equitably or use water wisely where it's already abundant. That's not an engineering problem, it's a human one. I made a video about how to desalinate water efficiently and solve water problems forever in one of my previous videos. Check it out if you wanna know more about it. So here's my question for you. If your region had surplus water while neighboring states faced catastrophic drought, would you share it freely, sell it for profit, or keep it as insurance against your own uncertain future? Because that choice is coming for all of us sooner than we think. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button if you like this video and hit the notification button not to miss the upcoming investigative videos.